There is no other way that we could start the Horse for Lifetime series with anybody but the Argo sponsored rider herself, Roz Cantor, badminton champion, Poe champion, former world champion, reigning European champion, the list goes on. Roz, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on again. Um, yeah, we're wintering very well. It's always a pleasure. Now, this I feel like is a tough question because you are very much in the thick of your career and I am sure that there are plenty of challenges, might talk about a few of them a little bit later on in the show, listeners, that could take this title. But as of now, who has been your horse for lifetime? Oh, I think that's got to be um, the legend with, that was all Star B. Um, you know, he really just uh, kick-started and accelerated my career in, in in a way that I never imagined. So, yeah, I am forever grateful for him. Dear old Albie, so take us back to your first meeting with him. Was it love at first sight? Um, no, I would say not, no. So he was delivered to my yard in a, in a van. Um, a van? Did he and, fit in a van? Well, well, yeah, he did fit in a van, yeah, in a little two-horse. He'd come from Scotland. And uh, my first impression was, he's really big. He was really big. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> he's so big. <laughs> how big How big was he? Um, I don't really know. But he was, he was, he was over 17 hands, definitely. But he was just quite a, quite a, an imposing horse as well, I suppose. I mean, in those days, he was quite weak in terms of, you know, he, he wasn't really furnished. He was quite an angular horse as a young horse, but um, he was still quite a solid looking horse, I'd say. How old was he at this point? He was eight when I took him on. Okay, so he'd be a little bit older. And had he done much or? Yes, he'd done. um, So Caroline Moore started him off. So she bought him from Via. Um, She did the first few events on him, took him round. I think two or three novices, but he wasn't particularly keen on water as a young horse. So he had a few cross country faults at water. And so Caroline had just literally got the job doing the, you know, doing the youth team stuff for British eventing and felt that she, you know, she shouldn't really um, be, it was her only horse and she shouldn't really be riding him and not going well cross country in front of, people that she was teaching and things like that so that so Emily Parker took the ride on so um, Emily Parker uh, was originally quite local to me and was very much under Caroline's wing at the time Um, and so she took him on she took him around a few novices and things and she was on the world class program and through world class I think she was kind of taken to Scotland for some training with Ian Stark and just loved it and never left. Um, so Albie went up to Scotland for a bit with Emily and then Caroline just wasn't really able to see him at all. Um, or, you know, you know, Caroline wanted to be involved in him. It's, you know, who she is as a person. So um, that's when he came back down to me. And in terms of the water problem, did he grow out of that completely? I always remember Andrew Nicholson talking about Nareo with ditches, I think. And he said he... He always still, even going down to the Vicarage ditch the year of badminton that he won, he still gave him an extra squeeze. Did the water totally leave? Did he leave that behind or did it stick with him? No, he did leave it behind. Yeah, he definitely left it, left it behind, but I don't think we ever took it for granted. Um, um, certainly in his early years, even when he went round his first five stars, I would we've got a little cross country course at home and I would water school him the day before an event for many years, not so much towards the end, but um, yeah, it was always in the back of my mind and I was lucky because he was always such a careful jumper that I could, some, I could at the start, particularly at the start, I came in quite pacey, quite fast to water with him. And then, um, you know, gradually that got better, but I could always ride in if I needed to. And I, yeah, I wouldn't have taken it for granted with him, but he never ever stopped at water with me, and he and he hadn't done kind of for the six months prior to me having him either. So it was something he was coming out of anyway. At this point, you hadn't yet ridden at the five star level. 
But did he give you the feeling quite early on that actually he would be a horse that would take you all the way and, and that he would go all the way? Well, I think uh, the big thing at that point, you know, in my career was that I, I had a huge amount of self-doubt. I didn't have a good system when it came to cross-country riding and things like that. And um, I think the five-star was felt like a long way off. Um and certainly, even when I went and did my five stars, I felt fairly out of my depth for a couple of years. So, uh, yes, I mean, straight away, he was clearly scopy um, and extremely careful. And that, that at least gave me quite a lot of confidence because he wasn't a horse that was going to rattle over a fence. You know, if anything, he went a bit too high and wasted time. Um, so, yeah, and Caroline always knew, you know, Caroline was always very much, we crack on, we get on with this, you know, because this horse could go around a big event. I don't think we probably ever quite realised how good he could become on the flat. That was that was his big challenge as a young horse. Was there a turning point with that? Um, I think just as he got older and stronger and was able to carry himself more. But he was, you know, as a young horse, when I got him at eight, he, I think we went to Osberton for uh, the three star. And I think, I think it, in old, in old numbers terms, I think I got a 57 dressage, which was very, very middle of the road. Um, he, you know, he just had no energy and engine when he was in a 20 by 60 arena. The moment he was, he had to turn corners. He lost all momentum and all desire to go forwards as well. I remember we just walked in the shoulder in. <laughs> <Just couldn't stop>. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, it, right to the very end, he was he was pretty lazy in the dressage. Um, he put a jump saddle on or a dressage saddle on. He had two very different personalities. He, you mentioned there your sort of strategy to cross-country riding which is something that you've very much developed now and I would say you're you're very open in talking about publicly how instrumental was he at that stage in your career at actually developing your sort of cross-country strategy yeah well I, I think it was you know make or break really um and and I think probably he highlighted it my lack of kind of the system and the and things like that more than any other horse because you know truthfully he was too big for me and he was also the more he went up the levels he was in a way quite an insecure horse and quite reactive to noise and and um atmosphere and adrenaline so the more he went around big events the harder he became to handle at the start of a cross-country course and if we didn't quite get that right he became very strong when he was out on the course so you know, it was uh, not only was my system not good enough, but I needed new tools to be able to handle a horse like him. You mentioned there that actually, you know, he was a big, big horse. Um, you're very petite. You're five foot two, I want to two, say. Two at a push, yeah. Two at a push, two on your tippy toes. Um, two, yeah. And he's sort of over 17 hands. He's also, I mean, coming to you when he's eight, he's a horse that's been produced by other people. So actually he's not one that's been in your system as such from a very, very young age. How did you train him to work with you? And how did you adapt your riding actually then to suit him in terms of just general partnership? Yeah, so I think um, that the really key thing that, with Albie is that he came at a time in my career where um, pretty much certainly for the first few years I was pretty much the only person that rode him um, you know because at that point I didn't have really have staff or certainly staff that were riding and things like that so you know all the gallop work everything was done by me which I think you know probably actually really really helped um, I mean nowadays you know, the people I've got surrounding me have been with me for years anyway, so it would have been fine. But at that point, I didn't. And I was very careful, you know, um, everything was planned with Albie. And if I went up the gallop um, again, I was always in the back of my mind thinking, actually, is he just, is he having fun? Is he just running? Is he, is he getting to a point where I couldn't get him back? So I never just kind of blasted up the gallops with him there was always a point where I'd go, right, we're halfway, we're hitting a bit of speed, but actually 
I'm not sure I'm in control of this speed, so we're going to take it back. We're going to do some transitions. We're going to go and do a bit of flat work up on the hill, you know, and take it back slowly again to then build up again. So it was always, there's a lot of thought that went into that. And I just never really wanted him to know how small I was and how big and strong he was. So I tried to do my best to always, you know, get on top of that before it, it got away from me. It's like good parenting isn't it? You sort of just have to bring them round to your way of thinking and not let them know that actually they could be in charge. Yeah, um, I mean, he never, he was so genuine, you know, it was never, it was never intentional on his part. He just, you know, on top of the fact that he was big, he didn't particularly have the softest, softest of mouth and he, he was quite a stiff horse to ride, you know, flexion, half passes and shoulder ins and things, you know, they weren't, they weren't the bit that he found easy. Um, you know, he liked going in straight lines. So you get him on a gallop in a straight line and he, he could quite easily forget that I was there. So it was just always about managing that and trying to, you know, think little things like we always changed his bit regularly. He never went up the gallops in a in a bit for two years. You know, we just pop different ones in all the time just to try and keep, you know, keep playing the game really a little bit. Is that something that's been very unique to him in terms of how you manage that? Or is that something you would do with a lot of your other horses now? No, I mean, I do it with them all. And I, I hope that I've, you know, educated my staff to do the same. That We are always evaluating and and talking about the horses and, and things like that. And we switch bits out and things. But he was he was definitely the starting point of that. And I probably haven't had another that I've had to be quite so careful, you know, like nowadays, because I've got more than one horse at, at four and five star level. We do gallop horses together and things like that. Well, I think I would have struggled to do that all the time with Albie and being able to stick with the control. Whereas, you know, Lordship's Graffalo, he's pretty chill about stuff. You know, he, he, he's more likely to buck and mess about, but it's done to get strong to the point where, I was struggling to hold him so it was just very different whereas Albie never really played he wasn't he wasn't a playful type he was he was just big he was just big and powerful and a little bit strong in the mouth what was he like as a person I mean he was a funny character he was um in a lot of ways at home he was quite insecure um he didn't cope that well if he really loved routine he liked to be fed first and things like that. He liked to go out in the field early, but he didn't like to be out in the field when there weren't any other horses out. And the moment another horse started to come in, in when we're in the winter routine, when they were, they just go out in the morning at, at the moment, um, the moment one horse came in, Albie was at the gate and needed to come in too. So he was very, very into humans. Um, you know, desperate for attention, uh, uh, quite a big fear of missing out on being left and things like that. So he was quite a clingy horse. Um, I had Zenshira running at a similar time and um, Zenshira was also a clingy horse. So a bit of a nightmare together. They they rarely ran at the same event because they just, they wouldn't have stood in the lorry by themselves and they screamed at each other. So he looked kind of always big and laid back, but he definitely had, you know, quite an insecure streak. Um, and for a little bit in his career, for about, I think, a season and a half, he just got a little bit cheeky on the lorry, and he used to walk on the lorry, turn around, and then run off again and gallop <laughs> off for a bit. And um, he, that, little things like that, he just, out of the blue, he just did sometimes have a slight flight instinct when you weren't quite expecting it, and he did it after his first burly you know, and he'd just gone round Burley, he'd gone round his first five star and all the way around, he just showed him, or he put him on the lorry to take him home and he ran off and he ran around the lorry clock at Burley for about 10 minutes um, when he was supposed to be tired. So he just, he had a bit of a funny streak and, you know, when he travelled abroad and stuff, we, we'd we be careful with him if he was loading on the plane or something like that, that his buddy was always close behind him or, or with him because he just did get get quite attached to things quite quickly. Um, but then in other ways, you know, he, he didn't buck, he didn't rear. Um, he was lovely. He was lovely like that. He was la lazy, lazy as could be at home in the arena. 
Um, and and then out hacking as he got older, he got more tricky. I think he just got a bit noise sensitive and things like that. So if you know if he trod on a twig or something and it cracked, he he would get a bit funny. And he he had this kind of funny half jog step on the way home where he wanted to get home. Um, so he he, he kind of had a funny and secure, slightly nappy streak, but he never wasn't like a planty nap. It was just that needing to be reassured quite a lot. Just to keep you on your toes, was he cuddly? Yes, he was an affectionate horse. Yes, yeah, and loved, you know, like really more than any of the other horses I had. You know, really enjoyed having one on one at a three day. You know, and had somebody that was his his person. He liked that a lot. Um, you know, he loved when Sarah went with him everywhere, and he really knew Sarah. And, and liked Sarah and whinnied at her and things like that when when we were away at events so yeah he did he was definitely definitely somebody that needed people around him favorite treat oh I think he ate any treat yeah he was, and it wasn't I don't, fussy. I don't remember him being particularly fussy no um let's go back to some of his his career highlights is there one outside of Tryon and the World Championships? Because we'll come on to that separately. Is there one outside of Tryon that really stands out for you with him? Yeah, so badminton 2017. So that was that was kind of my turning point in my career. So I'd done two burlies when I'd been slow, out of control, all those things that I've talked about before. Went to Chris Bartle over the winter, made some changes, practiced my system, went to badminton in the spring. So... I'd gone to the advanced at Western Park and and practiced the system and without even feeling like I was going fast, I'd come home with two time faults. And I just said to Karen, God, it's amazing. I just and he and the, and he felt in great balance as well and he felt light and responsive. And then I went to Badminton afterwards and I and I think it still is now probably the best. Uh, aside from some of the rounds I've had on Walter the best cross country experience of my life you know it just uh, I you know I was I think I was so new to the system I I you know I believed wholly in it and I and I put all my faith in it and Albie was um just in his prime I think you know as he got a little bit older he became slightly harder you know almost almost like the power steering and everything wasn't quite so on point but uh, on that day in that year he obviously felt amazing and the system worked and it, and it did just it just was I think a moment that even now I've got the video and I would look back and be very proud of it. Has your system changed much from that kind of initial system that you created with him? No no same. it hasn't no no it hasn't but it, it's evolved slightly because he was very strong and he was very slow. He wasn't the easiest horse to go from a gallop to a, a, you know, the canter you might need for a turning exercise or something like that. Always took a little bit longer. And, and I've, you know, with, with the Walters and things like that, I've been able to, to kind of um, just drum it down a little bit. It, you know, I had to be very clear with it before, whereas now I can be a little bit more subtle so that it all stays, the system stays the same. It's just now believing that, you know, I don't, I don't have to do it in such a clear way. Um, and that's taken a little bit of getting used to, because in some ways I, I thought, oh goodness, I'm not actually doing, I'm not sticking to that system. I should be. I am. I'm just a lot more subtle about it, which enables me to be faster. That badminton feels like it was a real breakthrough moment. Not only had everything you'd been working on with Chris and the team kind of come together, but for you and Albie, then you got your first senior championship call up to Stragon to the Europeans later that year. I remember watching your cross country round and on paper, it should not have been a track that would have suited him because it was twisty, it was turny, it was tight. It was a real racetrack, wasn't it? it was sort of kind of flat and um, th there weren't many straight lines from memory. How did that then compare and what was that round like? Because he went on for a top five finish there and, and that looked to be a really extraordinary moment that actually kind of set you up then for the World Championships the following year. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think probably that was the hardest track I ever rode on him. Um, the angles, I don't think I've jumped an angle again that was like, I think it was spent four or five at the beginning. Um, and the angle was really severe. And I remember we'd been down to watch Oliver. He was first to go for the team. I was second to go for the team. Um, I'd been down to watch Oliver go through and he'd run out there and I'd watch four or five others and literally no one had jumped it. And I kind of went back to the stables and hung around for a bit. And I thought somebody was going to come and tell me what to do. Because it was my first time in, in that team environment. So I was waiting and waiting. I thought, why hasn't anyone come and told me what to do yet? Like, surely they're going to say, well, maybe you should go the long route because that's what everyone's doing now. And then and so I, I got on my phone, I rang Chris and Bartle and I said, so what do you want me to do? And he said, stick to the system, stick to the system eyes on the end of the line make it happen off you go and I thought oh oh gosh I better get on with it then and um yeah no and and he was amazing and I have to say I mean he was pretty strong that day you know it was not his track you go all the way up one way and basically turn around and gallop all the way back the other with some twists in between so it, it wasn't really his track at all but he was um he was amazing you know because I did have to I mean I, I looked back, I don't think it was my prettiest round in terms of I looked like I was having a bit of a tug of war sometimes, which quite frankly I was with him. Um, but yeah, I mean, he was straight as a die by that point. He was on it. Sometimes it's one of those things, cross-country riding, It's you don't get marks for being pretty. It's about making it happen. Um, and I remember that day, it just felt like such a round of guts and determination and actually kind of a sign of what was to come because then the following year, back to badminton, um, almost the one that got away, that badminton, because as a he finished third, but as a very, very reliable show jumper, he had a, an uncharacteristic rail, which uh, just kept him in third on the podium. But he, he, I guess, cemented himself at this point as very much, you know, on the team list for try on. So talk us through that world championships. There felt like there was so much, I don't want to call it angst, but actually there was a lot of angst in the build up to that championship as to whether it was going to be ready in time. And then when you got out there, the conditions and then the the big hill was a point of much discussion. There was a storm coming in. There were all these things being talked about. What was it actually like going out there with him? Um, I mean, I think I don't really remember all that hype that much about the weather and, and the stuff like that. And I think that's where, you know, uh, Richard Waygood and, the, and the, the team around us are very good because, um, you know, we're very good at staying focused on what we can control. So from that point of view, it was absolutely fine. I actually really enjoy um, not traveling with the horses. Um, I like, you know, I quite like, and it doesn't happen a lot because often I'm driving a lorry and things but I do quite like and, and actually it's not something I'm so bothered about now but then I used to get quite bothered about you know like if we were driving a lorry a long distance we got stuck in traffic and things like that and I'd be like guys the poor horses and things whereas I quite liked that was almost the first time where Albie just left um, out of your control out of my control out of my sight I didn't really know what was happening I got there and, you know, I, I, had, I hadn't seen how long the journey was and things like that. So I was able just to say, right, it's time to crack on. And actually, you know, his journey wasn't without mishap. He actually got a bit of tummy ache when he got to America. So he wasn't all that well for a couple of days. Um, and and there, were, there were times when it was a little bit touch and go whether, um, you know, it was actually going to happen. So... Um, but just just the fact of that happening when I was still here and so I was completely detached from it and I just said you know you you guys you're with him you deal with him I'll look up you know look after stuff that's going on at home and then when I got out there I was able just to go well I didn't see any of that so we'll just crack on. His first phase in Tryon having kind of got over that bumpy start and it all of a sudden being all systems go. His first phase in try-on, um, he scored 24.6, which is a pretty magic 
score, to be honest. He'd, he'd gone slightly lower, that badminton in the spring, I think, 23.9 he'd got that year. So you knew he was on track with those kinds of numbers. What was your reaction to that test, you know, in that environment, at that venue, on that stage? Oh, I, I, I remember being extremely excited, uh, very relieved as well. I mean, I'll be... I had to work quite hard on the flat with Alba. I, I was often sweating just at home. So when you put the humidity <laughs> we had that day in try on, I remember like about five minutes before we going in saying to Kelly, I don't know if I can hold this up for much longer. Like, I don't know if my tummy's going to cope with this for much longer. And, and everyone just said, we jolly well get on with it. Like, <laughs> stick, your chest, stick your chest out, put a smile on your face and off you go. And I was pouring with sweat. I absolutely pouring with it. And, um, Bless him. I mean, I'd given him a day off the day before. I think, yeah, I remember because I'd ridden, I'd ended up riding him twice. He had a late dressage on the Friday. I'd ended up riding him twice on the Wednesday, which I hadn't planned to do because I didn't, we didn't realise that in the arena familiarisation, we would be allowed to actually work in the arena. So I'd worked him in the morning in preparation just for wandering around in the afternoon. And I ended up giving him a bit more work. And I remember getting on him on the Thursday, picking him up, literally moving the bit and thought god he feels really good he feels ready and caroline said well let's put him away then and so i literally did not do a step of trot on thursday i walked him around got off and then i on the friday morning i did 10 minutes and then he did him again in the afternoon so that that was quite good because that was like a, a real bit of like actually yeah we know what we're doing let let's let's trust trust our gut. let's go with this and, I was going to say good. that feels brave because there, there's always that temptation, isn't there, to just do a little bit. And actually, it's really something to say, nope, we're there. I trust that this is going to stay there for tomorrow. This is the right thing to do. Yeah, and he definitely, you know, he just wasn't a horse that was going to explode in the dressage. He wasn't, he wasn't that, that just wasn't him at all. If anything, it was the opposite. It was about, you know, keeping him inspired, keeping him off the leg um and all of that so um yeah it I think it it was it was the right thing to do because I knew I wanted to do a little bit on the Friday morning and it just would have been overkill for him and it was hot you know and he was a big horse he didn't need to he didn't need to kind of feel demoralized by the heat talk us through that cross-country round so all I remember was how much of a long day it was. It was the first time I'd gone really late. And obviously, because I was last to go for the team. So it was a long, old wait. But Gemma Tassel had gone out first. And she was fantastic. And she was great at kind of telling me to get on with it. And it's absolutely fine. Um, and then there was about a 25-minute walk to the cross-country start. She'd so get on at the stables and hack for 25 minutes. And there was like halfway along the hack to the cross country course there was a stop point where there was some cross country jumps and then you kind of carried on and then there was more cross country jumps at the start um but albie was a notoriously difficult starter so cert certainly by that point in his career he wasn't doing any practice fences um on the, went, day, on, went out the on the day without jumping a fence he didn't warm up at all by that point yeah, he just got, it just, the adrenaline got him too much and he just, he got a bit nappy and things like that. So he would have a jump early in the morning at a big one, say kind of 7 a.m. before the crowds came in. And then I would literally say at badminton, I think we, we timed it at eight minutes. I was on at the stables, trotted straight down to start, straight into the start box. He just couldn't cope with, with the warm up. Um, so, so try on was tricky because getting a 25 minute walk right without getting there too early and without getting there too late required quite a lot of people manning me <laughs> to make sure. <laughs> and then the weather wasn't, the weather was a bit drizzly. So I stuffed kind of gloves down my britches to make sure that if it, my gloves got wet, I had some spare pairs because 25 minutes is quite a long time of getting wet. And once I was on him and he knew he was going cross country, nobody would, would be able to go near him. He didn't like that at all because when he first got a bit tricky at the start, Caroline um, held him once for me and then he got wind of that. So so things like that. So we had 
uh, like Greg the farrier, he was with me in a quad bike coming with me. So he was then had a radio to the start and they could say like slow down, speed up because then there was a hole. So like you have to really slow down. So I was kind of zigzagging along the track because I couldn't risk getting there too early. So that was quite stressful. It, stressful to the point where I almost forgot about how nervous I was for the cross country. I, Great you know, distraction. It wrong. Slightly yeah. and not, then, not ideal. Not ideal. And then the really big thing I remember is that there was a, a really long gallop to the first fence. Like the first fence was something like 20 seconds into the course. It was a long way. Um, it was a really long way to the first fence. And, and do you know what? It was great for me because normally I'd potted to the first fence, jump, build up to the second jump, get to my first minute and think, God, I've lost loads of time now. Um, but I knew I couldn't do that because it was so far away. So I just, off I went. I went and I and I got a bit of a flyer over the first and it just set the tone really. I just kept chugging away the whole time and he was great. Coming home, knowing that you are clear inside the time, I think you moved up to individual silver at this point going into the, the jumping. The team are in pole position as well. What's the feeling as you come through the finish flags at that point? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's quite exciting, particularly, you know, because I was the last, you know, last of our, rota- you know, kind of rotation of riders. So all the other riders by that point were there watching and supporting. So it was a great atmosphere coming through the finish. And and I have to say, you know, so out of all the championships I've been to so far, it the, the team spirit and the way we all got on as a team was was the best I've ever had. So it was just a fantastic experience anyway. And um Everyone said, oh, you know, looking back, what was it like being in, you know, individual silver so close to the gold medal? And it's weird because I honestly didn't even clock it. I mean, I knew I was in second, but I didn't. We never just never spoke about it. It was all about the team and all about, you know, we just got on really well like that. And I absolutely I've got some really good um, photos of when I when. Ingrid had the pole down because I wasn't even watching. I was in the back because Albie was quite het up. So I was trying helping Sarah try and manage him a bit. Um, and but I just completely shocked, absolutely shocked by it because it just hadn't even been on my radar that, that I was just relieved I hadn't had too many poles down, you know, so that the team won because it was close enough for the team. So, so yeah, completely shocked really that that happened. What was it like having the day off? before the jumping because that feels quite unprecedented they did a trot up on that sort of final in in inverted commas final day that wasn't the final day and then because of the storm they delayed the jumping for a day did he mind that what did he make of it no he didn't mind it and it probably yeah no for him it didn't matter at all the the odd one felt the horses went a bit spooky and fresh um but Albie's not you know not really at a fresh horse you know he was tricky at the start of the cross country and things but he was only tricky in certain situations so from that point of view no he was fine um I don't I don't remember doing again I think I gave him a bit of a trot and a canter around I don't really remember jumping him a lot or do anything like that o- overly special I think it was just more of a get him stretched and make sure he was feeling well and and let him rest really Looking back now at kind of knowing where he took you and and actually, I guess, the, the springboard that he's given and helped to give your career, just how influential has he been in the success of Ros Cantor? Oh, massive. <clears throat> Absolutely massive. Um, I think, he, you know, he, he came along at exactly the right time for me. Um, you know, uh, to be quite honest, probably if I got him now, I wouldn't be as enthusiastic. You know, if he arrived on my yard as he did, you know, as an eight-year-old, as a weak eight-year-old with, you know, quite a tricky, quite a tricky mouth and things like that, then, you know, I'd almost think, is this the right horse for me? But I wasn't in that position at all. I was just grateful for a horse that was going to go around an intermediate that year. Um, and any any horse was was a good horse at that point in my career. So, you know, I think it just worked from that point of view. Um, 
and he was scopy and careful and that's what I needed at that time in in my career you know my cross-country riding I was a bit nervous I wasn't very confident the dressage bit I could do and he couldn't so from all those things we, we were able to help each other and um you know the hills that we've got at home he got stronger and stronger so I think there were so many things that that helped us along the way and you know like Caroline as well she I think you know we would both say he's changed our careers and our lives massively and he's brought us both together and you know now we're we're a great team with with all of my horses so yeah no I mean I'm I've got a lot to thank him for really. Can you sum him up in three words how would you describe him? Um, I think kind, loyal, and intelligent. They're three pretty powerful words, yeah. to be fair. Um, we've talked a, a lot about the partnership that you had with him, and it's obviously something that Agra is so passionate about protecting your partnership at the end of the day these incredible animals do so much for us um and it all comes down to the partnership and your best friends at the end of it how do you create that bond and what would be your biggest piece of advice for anybody that has a horse at home that they absolutely adore in terms of fostering and building on that partnership well I think having since having had my daughter particularly horses are, are essentially children in the way they think and behave and things like that so I think I think one thing it, it it's all about being clear it's all about being clear setting boundaries and and rewarding good behavior you know and 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 I think that that's a massive, massive thing. You've, you've got to be, you know, I've been up in Scotland doing some demonstrations and, and uh, you know, I've actually ridden ridden horses that were already up there. So I just got on strange horses at demonstrations. And that's what I talked about a lot is that, you know, in order for me to ride like I want, I need to cross country. My horses have, have got to be well trained. And, and it is just, it's just setting clear boundaries. And so if it's not right, it's repeated if it is right it's praised and and that's whether you're you're dealing with them on the floor or when you're riding or you're hacking or anything else and then on top of that is interpreting each horse's individual personality so if if something you know if a horse needs educating or you need to repeat something because it wasn't good enough what pressure tolerance does that horse have you know, you've you've got human beings, you've got children, let's say you've got children who you could raise your voice at or, or be quite firm with and, and it wouldn't bother them. And you've got other children that the moment you did that, they burst into tears and get emotional about it. And and that's exactly the same as horses. They all have a pressure dial and it and it's understanding which horse has that, you know, what personality your horse has and then and then creating a system where they know what you know right and wrong is very clear i'm not saying wrong in terms of naughty wrong in terms of do they understand the job at hand or not praise when you're saying reward good behavior what would be your method is that simply taking the pressure off on a pat is it a treat or is that subjective to the um, we don't really do treats in our yard particularly, but um, no, just just pats and yeah, I use my voice a lot when I'm riding, you know, good boy, good girl, um, a pat, a rest, a stretch, you know, there's so many different ways of doing it, but they, they've got to understand that and understand that that's what it means, that they've, they've achieved something that we were trying to achieve, the goal has been achieved. And, and, I, and again, I talked about this lot at the weekend that, you know, a horse might need to repeat something three days in a row um, and it might take 40 minutes the first day, it might take 30 minutes the second day. They might come out on the third day and, and do it in five minutes. And if that's the case, I would give my horse a big pat and take it in. You know, I don't have to be riding 45 minutes every day to feel like I've achieved something. And, and on that day, it would be tempting to go, right, they've ticked that box, so let's move on to the next and let's train them in something else. But 
out of experience actually they just a reward you know a big pat and say that was great well done and go in that boost morale just just like with children or human beings you don't then say well then you've got that right now I'm going to teach you something even harder that that's for the next week or the next month so it's just building slowly but repeating and being very clear I think so it's um exactly the same on the ground and in a stable yard it's just all about appreciating each horse's individual personality so if you've got a horse who is really cuddly as a fussy horse he's more central in our yard he's nearer where the cross ties are where we saddle up and then you might have another horse who would just rather a quieter area isn't particularly affectionate and then we've got like a brickyard which is much quieter so um they're seen much less in a day so I think all the time you know like if a horse wants attention and wants fuss I love to give them fuss but equally there's no point me wanting to cuddle my horses all the time if it's not actually who they are as a person. I think there are some good parenting advice there listeners. Uh, good advice <laughs> I'm not on quite how... sure I'm as good at it as my child. <laughs> it doesn't seem to follow the rule book quite as well as the horses do. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's all practice. It's all practice. Hey, listeners, if you can nail it with the horses, the kids are next in line. Um, it's a good, it's a good way of explaining it though, because it's very, very true, and it's about finding out what works for them, finding out what makes them tick, and then I love the the analogy of the pressure dial because actually, some it's so tempting, isn't it? If something all of a sudden clicks, to be like, right, great, on to the next thing, or I'm going to keep doing that, but in reality taking the pressure off that that reward is is what they want and and ultimately that's highly successful um yeah. and just quickly horses don't forget you know like children six like children in the field or a year off it's like riding a bike once they've nailed a skill they they've got that skill so we don't have to then you know panic that we need to drill it in every day of the week once they've got it they've got it they're good like that okay let's talk for a second about Agria because we are so excited about this series and it's been the most perfect way to kickstart uh, the Horse of a Lifetime series in 2024 uh, with All-Star B and, and kind of reflecting on some of his and your great achievements. Um, but tell us a little bit about what inspired your partnership with Agria. Yeah, so Agria, um, you know, I get to know the guys there more and more all the time and I think like they, they're incredibly generous um an incredibly generous company and they um they just really have horses and owners right at the forefront of their you know of their importance levels and um we were lucky enough to to have a lunch with them like they they brought my whole team down to olympia uh, to the linden international horse show this year and we had lunch with them and it just absolutely shone that they're just all horse mad people as well and they're they're completely in it for the right reasons and and that's where I think you know their their lifetime insurance policy so it doesn't matter what age your horse is it doesn't matter what previous injuries the horse has had your horse will always be covered um you know if, if your horse has had colic and gets colic again you will still be covered under insurance and I, and, and every single person that I've met that works with Agria um that is just it's their thing that's what that's what they do they are all actually in it for all the right reasons it's enormously powerful because and we've, we've spoken about this at the top of the show listeners you'll have heard from Vicky and, and a little bit more about kind of the ethos around the, the lifetime insurance policy and everything else but it, it's that peace of mind isn't it it's that um, knowledge that actually you're covered because these horses we've been talking about partnership and and actually just how deep that runs and you want to be able to do your best by them all of the time and this helps you do that so it's an incredibly yeah, important message absolutely i mean you know and, and uh, unfortunately and very sadly all star b isn't with us now but i still have one of my other horses of a lifetime zentura he's just turned 20 and um you know, he's he's just still the centerpiece of our yard and always will be. He's not going anywhere. Um, we absolutely adore him. And so to be able to have that confidence that, you know, because he's he's our horse, he's not a horse I'm getting an income from. He he's kind of 
in a stable which probably I could have another horse in but to have that confidence that you know we can we can keep him into his old age and give him the life that he deserves um is great that leads on quite nicely to talk about a few of your other potential horses of a lifetime and and Alfie's and Shearer certainly you know plenty of our listeners will be familiar he was very much at kind of the peak of all-star b's career as well he is now 20 as you say am i right in saying that he is now uh, he's not long in the tooth because he has no teeth and that actually it's given him a yeah. new lease of life yeah he's absolutely hilarious now because he's got no front teeth because he had a tooth disease problem and so they took out his he went in to have some teeth out and I just thought he'd kind of have one or two out and he came back with no teeth front top or bottom all the way along the front and Alfie being Alfie Alfie's kind of quite laid back if he if he was a human being he'd be like the teenager with the jeans falling around his bottom and his his room would be messy things like that very endearing but but you know just just would be a bit slobbish maybe and now his tongue just hangs out um like it like uh, all the time I mean it, it gets it gets worse and worse but he was out hacking today and quite funnily enough Georgie who works for me was riding him today out hacking we had a little canter and Alfie went at the back which I thought was quite brave when Georgie said she was going at the back but he very nearly booked her off which was highly amusing <laughs> but he canters along out hacking with his tongue flapping um so yeah he's very very funny but very well which is lovely is he still in charge of chaperoning the babies or is no, he can't teaching do it. that now? He's not behaving well enough to do anything like that. <laughs> His job was supposed to be chaperoning babies and doing ride and lead with the children out hacking. He can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> can't do it. A um, couple of the others. And these are the these are the kind of the young pretenders. You know, if we were to talk in five, six years' time and have this conversation again, who knows what these guys will have done. I'm going to start with Lordship Scraffalo, badminton champion. Um a horse who's been fourth at World Games, he or World Championships, he has been second at badminton as well, plus European champion by a country mile in very, very impressive form last summer. And and kind of it feels like there are hugely exciting things for him in the future. How does he fit in to this horse of a lifetime puzzle for you at this stage? Yeah, I think he's well on the way already, isn't he? He's, um, yeah, I mean, I I love every inch of Walter, I really do. Um, All-Star B, I just have huge respect for because now particularly I've got a horse like Walter and some of the others, I realise how, how much he put into being as good as he could be. You know, he did the work, he did the revision. And he came out with the grades. Walter's life is a little bit easier. It comes to him a bit easier in that respect. So um, the riding at home and things like that, from my point of view, is slightly more enjoyable because Albie was a bit heavy to ride. He didn't particularly enjoy the schooling work at home. Um, I often felt I had to be a little bit on his case all the time, whereas Walter, Walter could have you know, he, he he does need keeping on top of a little bit, but essentially finds it easier to train on a daily basis, I'd say. I mean, he's a quirky character as well, but he's mellowed as he's got older. Um, but he's, yeah, he's, a, he's a, an easier horse to ride, I suppose, on my body as well. You know, I don't have to put quite so much into it. And um, he's just highly entertaining on a daily basis. You were saying at the start of, of when we started chatting for this recording and I was kind of going, yeah, how is he? How's life at home? And you were saying that actually he had his first jump of the year the same time as London 52, who would be quite well known for his exploits. But Walter didn't quite go at it with the same sort of zest. Is that no, fair no, fairly laid back, pretty chill. I mean, I don't think he knocked anything down. We probably just popped a few <laughs> about a metre, but he probably did a metre and point naught, what of a centimetre, um, <laughs> flop, flopped over. Didn't think it was really worth getting out of bed for. So I thought it's a shame we didn't video really because it would have been quite funny to put the two side by side. Um, Walters definitely would look more disappointing. But he has since had one book when he jumped. 
and um yeah i mean in his own way he loves it but he just he's not outwardly kind of um you know raving about it i guess he knows what he's got to do and he knows when it matters and and i guess the main thing is knowing them and if that if that's what he does every year that's what you want him to do every year yeah, well, Walter. Walter's either completely like that, or he's very explosive. And if he and he and he does it at weird times, you know, and he and he will, he will this winter still do do a few explosions. But it wouldn't be necessarily when you think he's going to do it. Um, so yeah, he, he's a he's a he's a great character. That he's he's ever so comfortable in his own skin. You know, he he wouldn't uh, he he wouldn't you know Albie was. You know, he was a trier and he was, I'm not saying Walter doesn't try because he does in his own way, but he is, he's comfortable. You know, he's a comfortable horse, which is, which is great. It makes, you know, he's got a nice life in that respect. What about is Lot DHI, the Poe winner and the Blenheim winner? Tell us a little bit about him because obviously he's very much on the upward trajectory. And again, you know, he's not particularly old. I want to say he is 11 this time yeah so 11 this time yeah so he's still a he's still a really young horse and he's actually come through this winter looking the best he's ever looked um body wise he's just starting to hit maturity i think and he's been a kind of lanky leggy you know every time he stops work over a winter his neck disappears and um look, goes on forever but there's no muscle to it and this winter he's had a, a bit of a longer break actually and and he's kept his weight really well and he's just starting to kind of furnish, I think, which is lovely. Um, yeah, I mean, very different behaviour wise sometimes. Um, <clears throat> would be my most challenging horse I've had to train. Um, but equally is very trainable in, in a lot of respects. He's just very, very spooky. And I have to hold my hand up and saying, um, we haven't yet been in the arena because um, yeah, I just you know, hack for a little bit longer. <laughs> what he likes doing <laughs> he's still got his winter woolies yeah. on and he's hacking um yeah and we we just yeah we'll, we'll keep the arena work to when the sun comes out and it gets a bit warmer i think do a bit on the hill it'll be fine it yeah and he's fine done. once he gets going out and about in the lorry it, it's fine it's just yeah hacking's a bit easier than the school work when he's at this time of year anyway it's about what's what makes them tick, listeners. That's yeah. the secret to a good partnership. Uh, compromise every so often as well. <laughs> um, I know that the listeners are going to be thinking, what is the plan? So I'm going to ask the question everybody wants to know the answer to, uh, particularly your two big boys. What will be the plan this spring? Is there anything you can share? Well, I can't share a huge amount because it's not quite set in stone yet, to be honest, what I'm doing. There's, there's plans A, plan B, plan C's. But I'm not sure which order they're running in yet. So <laughs> they certainly both planning on coming out at the start of the season. They'll probably run at Osby and Lincoln or Osby or Lincoln. And we'll, we'll more than likely head to Thorsby probably for the four star. So and kind of that's as far as we've got. But um, yeah, I'm looking I'm looking forward to getting them out there. You know, that I'm very, very lucky. They're fantastic. Both of them fantastic courses. Is a lot might give me a bit of a run around at the start of the season. But, you know, I... I, you know, at least I have confidence now that we can we can get our where we want to get by the end of the season. So it's all good. There you go, listeners. We've got it. We've got something out of her. That's what we've got to look <laughs> forward to over the next uh, next couple of months. But of course, lots to look forward to. Uh, badminton on the horizon. Of course, the Olympic Games this year in Paris as well. Um, Ros, world champion. This is more, I guess, on, on you than the horses, but we've got you, so we're, we're going to ask you. Um, you're a world champion. You you know, you've picked up that accolade, European champion as well. What would it mean to go to an Olympics and to actually add that accolade to your already very impressive CV? Um, yeah, I think that would be massive for me. It really would. Um yeah, I think, I mean, I grew up, you know, my dad loves sport and stuff. We grew up loving watching the Olympics and I and I still do now. I'd get excited watching anything that is like an Olympics where it's multiple sports and everybody's in it for the same reason. So I think it really ticks that box for me and for our family. So it would be hugely exciting, um, you know, and I think I, I know, 
you know, in, in a way now I know I deserve to be there. I know I'm good enough to be there. Okay, everything has to align. You know, a horse can bruise its foot the day before. You know, we can be not quite right. Form can't be good enough. And and I'm realistic in that sense. It's not it's not going to ruin my life if I don't get there. But it would be a huge project for me, definitely. And I think, you know, I, I do feel, um, I don't, don't know if it's mum guilt, but I certainly do feel pulled in many directions quite a lot of the time and the balance is hard and I and I in some ways would feel you know I'm uh, I'm going to put all into it this year and and if I could come out with that 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 would be you know all justified then yeah I think that sums it up very very well well look there'll be so many people behind you over the coming months cheering you on and I'm sure there'll be plenty of people that can't wait to see uh, you out and about competing at the start of the season as well I hope that the last couple of uh, months or few weeks as it probably is now of the off season so to speak uh, treats you well thank you for being the first brilliant guest on our Horse for Lifetime series Uh, we're delighted to have Argo on board and no better way to kickstart it than with you so thank you very much and All Star B this one is for you. Thank you.